Davo points to what she sees as a problem with the regional airlines in general, cost cutting. Their whole model, business model, is to fly inexpensive aircraft and save a lot of money because they have a fixed price contract. So if they can fly cheap planes, cheaply, they make money under their contract. If they have more expensive pilots and more expensive planes, they don't. The Regional Airlines Association disputes that and told NBC News that their focus is on safety, professionalism and reliability of service. Still, there are differences of opinion within the industry about how much flying time is required to pilot a commercial aeroplane. You can be done with those ratings in as little as 350 hours of experience. And what happens is when people get out of flight school um, and they have their required government ratings, they then move on to the regionals because that's who hires them. While major airlines usually pay better, they also demand that new pilots have 1,500 flight hours or more. Further blame could lie with how Colgan trained its pilots on the Q400's stall protection system. Although it satisfied Federal Aviation Authority standards, some of the training was done solely in a classroom setting, not hands-on. 15 minutes, that's all they're asking out of a training program, and they didn't even do that. They talked about it in ground school. The alarms are going off, the stick is pulled out of your hands, the natural reaction is to take it and yank it back. It's a natural reaction, is what he did because he's never been trained. The safety board report also focuses on crew fatigue. Both the captain and co-pilot spent the night not in a hotel or their own beds, but instead in a crew lounge against Colgan policy. And once behind the controls, they violated the sterile cockpit rule, which may have been the cause of their distraction. During takeoffs and approach to landings, the pilot and the co-pilot, the entire crew, can talk about nothing but the flight at hand. The idle conversation that was going on seems to have distracted them long enough for the aircraft to get to that point where it was a jarring moment that caused them to react. The crash sparks enough debate that in the summer of 2010, the president signs a bill passed by Congress requiring commercial pilots to have a minimum of 1,500 hours of flying time. But even beyond that, there are a score of other safety provisions. They would require the FAA to get much more tough on pilot fatigue. They would require that the airlines disclose who's actually operating their flights so that no longer could people buy a ticket on Colgan without knowing it. So this legislation is very significant. The companies let them down a lot. They didn't give them the tools they needed, I think, is really what it came down to. You got two relatively inexperienced pilots. It's a fact of life. Eight years earlier, there was another air disaster over New York, also caused by human error. An Airbus A300 takes off from JFK Airport to Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. Soon after takeoff, the plane encounters severe turbulence. It rolls, pitches, and then suddenly, the tail snaps off. The plane nosedives into a residential area in Queens, New York. All the people that were on that airplane went for a, a very harrowing ride in the last minute of flight going into the ground. All 260 on board are killed, as well as five people on the ground, leaving investigators wondering how and why the tail would snap off an airplane. of November 2001. It's a bright, sunny autumn morning as American Airlines Flight 587 climbs into the sky. In the cockpit are two experienced pilots, co-pilot Sten Molin and Captain Ed States. He loved to get in the airplane. He loved to be in charge. He respected everybody's job, everybody's role. The co-pilot is flying the plane that is about five miles behind a 747 on its way to Japan. Uh, the Air 587, heavy 1300 feet, we're climbing to 5,000. But since the Airbus is climbing faster than the plane in front of it, Flight 587 quickly flies into the 747's wake, causing the American Airlines plane to experience turbulence. This in itself is not uncommon. 
Airplane wakes are very similar to the wakes made by boats or ships. Uh, it's a displacement as the vehicle passes through this fluid, in one case water, in one case air. This simulation illustrates a different jet flying into wake turbulence. The wing tips from the lead plane create what is known as a wake vortex. You can think of it as a very large cone coming back off the tip of the leading airplane. And if the trailing airplane intercepts that cone, you'll feel choppiness. Typically, the encounters are very brief, but you can hit them multiple times. And that is exactly what happens with Flight 587. There are two wake encounters. Although invisible to the eye, they are displayed in this animation. The first wake causes the plane to roll to the left, and the co-pilot quickly puts it back on course. But then, 15 seconds later, the plane is caught in a second wake. When this pilot got into the wake turbulence, the airplane started to roll. He put in flight control corrections that he thought was necessary to, to get the airplane back to a wings level state. But instead of leveling out, the plane moves violently on all three axes of flight. Left and right rolls, side to side motion, and up and down. Then the unthinkable happens. The tail snaps off. The plane banks left and plummets into a residential neighborhood in Bell Harbor, Queens. Just two minutes and 24 seconds after a routine takeoff, everyone on flight 587 is gone. Yeah, just to let you know, we saw a huge, um, tremendous amount of black smoke uh, south of Long Island. Captain Ed State's wife, Mary, is home when she finds out about a crash in Long Island and contacts American Airlines. I got the, uh, one of the chief pilots in New York and it wasn't the, I guess, you know, wasn't the ideal way of telling me, but I said, was Ed the pilot? And they said yes. A devastating loss of life, a horrible scene in a residential neighborhood. It looks like a war zone. If you've seen anything on television, it's just terrible. Just two months after 9-11, People are wondering, could this be another terrorist attack? Everyone should remain calm. We talked to the White House several times. There's air cover. In this anxious climate, the safety board works to find the reason the tail of the plane broke off. Coming up, outrage over the official cause of the crash of American Airlines Flight 587. In November 2001, when American Airlines Flight 587 crashes into a Queens residential area, the scars from 9-11 are still very raw. The industry was recovering, traffic was down, people were apprehensive. It was a period of time that after 40 years of being in the industry, I've never seen before or since. I see the plane, the engine fall down. Two months after the September the 11th attack, another plane is down, and at first an act of terrorism is feared. We've uh, preliminarily uh, put the city on high alert, so we've closed certain things down, just to make sure that we find out what this is all about. Former Inspector General of the Department of Transportation, Mary Schavo, followed the investigation. That was everybody's first thought, but there were a number of, of you know, clues, and they came out really quickly that it wasn't because you had, um, you know, you had the cockpit voice recording. And then when they found part of the plane was detached from the plane itself, I mean, you knew right away because pieces of the plane just are not ever supposed to fall off. With terrorism eliminated as the cause, investigators focus on why the tail broke off. It takes more than two years before the findings are released. According to the report, the cause of the crash is the separation of the tail or vertical stabilizer due to the first officer's excessive use of the rudder pedal. The entire vertical fin, which is the vertical stabilizer as well as the rudder, separated from the fuselage and the airplane at that time became no longer controllable. Normally, pilots only use controls called ailerons and flight spoilers to roll the airplane to wings level. These are panels located on the wing. The co-pilot does this, but he also uses the rudder. 
This is the panel attached to the vertical stabilizer, or the tail. It moves the plane from side to side. The rudder is operated by moving two foot pedals on the floor of the flight deck, forward or back. It was his reaction and the overuse of the rudder during this encounter that generated forces that were large enough to actually snap the fin, the vertical fin off. Aviation analyst John Cox is satisfied with the findings, but the report is controversial. Aviation safety consultant Greg Fyth believes a closer examination is necessary. It's easy to say that the pilot put too much. The question is why, and that question to this day still hasn't been answered. The NTSB in its public hearing actually identified 11 events that had taken place involving these high loads where the vertical stabilizers fortunately did not separate. So now you have a trend here, you have a history, you have a historical record. But what I see in their investigation was they looked at all of these things in isolation rather than trying to find not only why the loads occurred, but how they occurred. And Mary Schavo believes there is another issue. In their accident investigation, they have to rely on the manufacturers. And therein lies the problem. They had to go back to Airbus and say, hey, Airbus, what happened to your plane? And Airbus said, well, it was the pilot. The pilot used the rudder too aggressively. Why would you ever construct a plane and ever have the control system in the plane such that if it's used in a way in which it's allowed to be used, your tail would come off? It is. It is unthinkable. Airbus told NBC News that it was not a design flaw that caused the tail to break off. It was pilot error. The safety board, in fact, did determine that. It also found that the American Airlines training program overemphasized the use of the rudder pedal inputs. Going a step further, John Cox says the rudder should never be used in wake turbulence. The best response would have been to let the airplane's natural stability work work through it. The airplanes are naturally very stable and so put some control input in to bring the airplanes back toward wings level and let it fly out and it'll settle right down. American Airlines told NBC News that it continues to be disappointed with the safety board's findings. They say they believe that the design and rudder sensitivity were at fault. A decade after the crash, the report stands as written. But in August 2010, the safety board started re-examining four similar incidents and urged agencies to take a closer look at the rudder design. Pilots now understand you don't have to move the rudder that much as far as the pedals are concerned to create a large aerodynamic force. It's a powerful tool in helping the pilot uh, in roll control. So be sensitive to the fact that, hey, if you're going to move this, you better use it as a last resort. But this knowledge came at a very high price. There is this adage out there in the aviation industry, how much blood has to be spilled before we take corrective action? Safety does have a price. A jet is flying over the Florida Everglades while the crew is trying to fix a problem with the nose gear. It shouldn't be a crisis situation, but it quickly becomes one. The L-1011 crashes into the swamp, killing 100 people. What amazed me was they said that it was unsurvivable. How do you come out of that? December the 29th, 1972, Eastern Airlines Flight 401 is on the final leg of its flight from JFK to Miami International, carrying 163 passengers and a crew of 13. Ron and Lily Infantino were married just 20 days before and are now returning home from their honeymoon. Perfect flight, smooth, calm air. Uh, it was just a, a very dark night. The L-1011 is just five miles from the runway when the pilot extends the landing gears. Green lights indicate the main landing gears are down, but the nose gear indicator remains dark. The nose gear showed that it wasn't either down or up. It didn't say what position it was actually in. So they broke the approach and advised air traffic control that they needed some time to sort through a technical problem. Unaware of what's going on in the cockpit, flight attendant Beverly Raposa feels the plane turn away from the airport. 
I wasn't concerned because, I mean, things like that happened. And if there was a problem, we had a phone.